Well, hello and welcome. The this is a really wide room. I'm going to have to make sure and look both directions as I talk. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, I started organizing this a few months ago. There was a discussion in the PHP user group community about how it's really difficult in many cases to bring speakers in from outside. And this is an issue that was discussed and they said, well, it'd be really great if we could find a way to solve this. And I said, well, challenge accepted. But I'm not just going to go to one user group or find a way to go to one user group. I'm going to put together a tour, and I'm going to go to as many user groups as will have me. So 18 user groups on the schedule later, here I am. Uh, and of course, as you can probably imagine, doing something this size and scope is difficult and challenging logistically. Uh, I'm sure my hair is thinner for it, and it's also expensive. And so we've gotten some sponsors together to help pay the expenses Again, I flew myself here, it's not cheap, and even an airline wouldn't be cheap. Uh, and no one has done more to help out with this tour than a group, a company called Code Climate. And they are doing something really cool for PHP that I'm going to share with you before Cal gets up here and talks. So let me put the right slides up. And I hate that native scrolling that Cal has on here. All right, so I'm going to share with you what they've been working on because I think it's really fantastic. So all of us in our applications have complexity. Complexity is just part of software. As we develop our applications, we trade the simplicity of the application for the features in our application. And we have complexity in a number of different ways. We have domain complexity that just comes from the fact that our application is unique in some way. We have deadline pressure. Nobody ever has a deadline. Our team changes from time to time. People quit, people come on board, different coding styles. Our business plans change, and we have different people on our teams with different skill levels. Not everybody codes at the same level. So what can we do about this? There are a couple things that we want to do about this. The first one is we want to assemble information. We want to put information together and say, okay, what is it about our complexity that, that, that we know? And then we want to act on that. We want to do something about it. And there are a few ways to do this. Code reviews is one of them. Anybody in here do code reviews on a regular basis? Actually, more people on average than the most of the groups I've been to. So that's good. I'm glad to see that. And code reviews are great. I, I'm a big fan of code reviews at Mozilla. When I worked at Mozilla, we did code reviews for everything that was on more than like three lines. So code reviews are fantastic. And there are a lot of benefits to them. They're collaborative. You talk with a developer. You and another developer or you and several developers get together, go over the code, you learn from each other, you go through the code, and you catch issues before they actually make it into production. But there are some drawbacks to code reviews. In particular, they're subjective. There was one guy at Mozilla that every time I had him review my code, four review cycles later, he was still finding things he didn't like. Not because I didn't do what he asked me to do, but just because this time he felt like this wasn't right or that wasn't right. I avoided this guy like the plague because it were very subjective. In addition, when you and a developer get together and talk and learn from each other, the information tends to be siloed. I know it and you know it, but the rest of the team doesn't know it. Code reviews are often inconsistently applied. They tend to go out the window when deadline pressure gets really, really high because we got to ship this now and code reviews be damned. Let's just, let's just get it done. We'll deal with it later. And because everybody who's doing code review is a developer, they're not managers because managers don't code, right? Because we're all developers, we're all busy. We're all writing code and that's our job, but we still have to review other people's code. So a lot of times these fall by the wayside. So when it comes to qualitative information, it's really hard to know if we're getting better. In addition, there are some software metrics tools we can use to get a, qu a, a quantitative measure. And the benefits of these are objective and they're actionable to some degree. We can do something about the metrics. But a lot of times we find these are noisy. Anybody in here use PHP mess detector? Just one or two people. If you use it, you find out it has a lot of things that it does. But it's really, really noisy. They're really hard to set up and maintain. So it takes a lot of time to set this up. And in practice, because they're noisy, because they're hard to maintain, nobody really ever looks at them. And they don't squawk, they don't complain, so nobody ever really looks at them. So when it comes to quantitative data, it's also really hard to tell if we're getting any better. So the people who created Code Climate said, okay, this sucks, let's fix it. 
And they did a few things that are really, really cool. The first one is they came up with a GPA on a four-point scale that says generally how your code is doing. The other thing that they did that I think is really cool is they came up with a timeline that says over time which files are getting better, which files are getting worse. So you don't just see the whole overall project, but you see how it changes over time. This is really, really cool, really revolutionary. In particular, this makes changes trackable. You can see how they change over time. You can see if we've improved or gotten worse over time. You can see how your test coverage is doing. It'll hook into your test coverage. And then you can also see whether or not a particular branch, when you get ready to merge it, will improve your code. They've come up with some graphs that track change over time. PHP MyAdmin is really stable, so this graph doesn't change a whole lot. But for things that do, it goes up and goes down and goes up and goes down. And hopefully, it's going up and to the right. Your quality is getting better. The idea was to make this visible so that you can understand and share this with your team, your responsibility is shared, and you can set some goals. And the best part is that when your boss comes to you and he says, hey, this feature's taking a really long time, why is that? You say, you remember all that code that, that we were telling you about that sucks? Yeah, let's look at this, and you see all these Fs? This is what we need to fix, and this is what's killing us. So people who aren't technical can look at this and have a sense of how things are de developing. Code climate will bother you in your chat room. This is, I think it's hip chat, I think it is. Uh, it'll pop up a message and say, hey, this file went from an A to an F. Um, and it will, it will complain. So you get an instant notification. You get instant information about how files are doing. Uh, and so this makes this actionable. You can actually detect problems when they're introduced before they get into production. And you can add this to, as your part of your code reviews. Because code climate is really fast at this. It does it really, really quickly. And you have a subjective, and now that rather than a subjective measure, you have an objective measure of your code. You can compare branches. So this is master of WordPress compared to 3.5. You can see that it's declined in quality. I didn't know that was possible, <laughs> but whatever. And it'll also show you things like duplication and complexity. Really big, really obvious. And if you'll notice on the left, there's red. That red there is test coverage. Those are areas of the code that are tested. So it will also show you where your code is, is covered under test. Code Climate's available right now as uh, public beta for PHP. It's free entirely for open source. Uh, and I have gift cards for closed source projects for two free months of Code Climate uh, that I'm going to pass out to each one of you. Uh, so take a look at it, check it out. Uh, any questions I can answer about this, about Code Climate? Pricing. It starts at $99, uh, and it's based on team size. Uh, so for less than an hour of developer time a month, you get automated code review, which I think is really great. So it's 99 a month? Yeah. It'll uh, work for any repository. You, if you have it inside your company, you can poke a hole in the firewall with an SSH key. It'll work over that. If you have it on GitHub, it'll work with that. Um, for public repositories on GitHub, uh, they consider those open source and those are free. Yeah. It's hosted by them. And they do have a privacy and security policy that you can review if you have issues. You know, I know some companies are really concerned about their code, um, which is understandable. But they do have a, a really good policy that, that you can check out. Yeah. Does it integrate with any uh, ticket system? It does. In fact, uh, it op uh, I don't know ex specifically which ones it, it, open it integrates with. I know it integrates with some of them, and I know they're working. In fact, uh, Noah, the co-founder, was telling me today that they're about to open source their integrations repository uh, of all the things that it integrates with. So you'll be able to add if there isn't one there. But I know it, op it works with a lot of them. Uh, I think Mantis is one. GitHub is another. There's a few that it integrates directly with. And they're adding them all the time. But the idea is, you look at the code, and you see I have an issue. You can open one right there. And they've, they've integrated that. They've made that kind of seamless uh, for that purpose. Good question. Any others? Yeah. Have you ever used it on a project? I have. Um, I've used it both with open source projects and with my own closed source projects. Uh, I find that it's getting better and better as it goes along. Again, it's in public beta. Um, but it does show me, you know, it, it, it gives me a gut feeling. You know, my gut feeling is either confirmed or I, I see that complex something's really complex, and I go, okay, I need to refactor that. I need to fix that. 
Uh, and I really, I've enjoyed working with it. Yeah. You said it's PHP and Mobile Beta. Is that implying that they have others that they're working on? Or? They started in Ruby. Uh, and that's where they came up with the system that turns it into nodes and, and does uh, both duplication and uh, complexity matching. Uh, then they moved to JavaScript, so it supports JavaScript. For PHP developers, that's really great because most of us use JavaScript a lot. Uh, and they're adding PHP next, or they've added PHP next. Um, they say it's in public beta because they're still tweaking a little bit. And they want feedback. They want the community's feedback. So if you use it and you go, this, this, this doesn't look right, this doesn't feel right, and you tell them they're going to work on fixing that. You know, that's because they're interested in being a part of the PHP community and working, working with the, the community to get a good sense of how this works. For shops that use more than one language, is it all covered under that $99? All languages that they support are covered. Uh, so if you use Ruby and PHP, perfectly fine. When they add support for Python, I believe that's on their roadmap, that'll be covered too. Uh, it, you just, it's one account and all of them work. You just add the repository and it knows which things it can handle and which things it can't. HTML it unfortunately doesn't do anything with. <laughs> There's not really a whole lot you can do with HTML except validate it. Um, but, you know, it's on hand. Okay. I'm going to be here after uh, if you have more questions. Uh, but right now I want to introduce your speaker for the evening. His name is Cal Evans. Uh, for those of you who don't know Cal Evans, he's been doing PHP for a very long time. In fact, I think they were chiseling it on rocks when he started. Uh, so uh, he's going to talk tonight about his passion, which is PHP from the command line, because he sucks as a designer. So ladies and gentlemen, Cal Evans. Good evening. OK, real quick, how many of you have actually heard me talk? OK, the ones with your hands down. No, oh, keep your hands up. OK, the ones with your hands down. Take your cues from these people, okay? If they laugh, you laugh, because they recognize I told a joke. Sometimes it's hard to tell, so just work with me here. Um, my name is Cal Evans. As Brandon said, um, I was God's original programmer when he invented PHP. So, um, and I've been doing it, actually, I've been working with PHP since um, version 3.5 back in 1999, so quite some time. Um, I, was, I, I had absolutely no choice as to whether I was doing this tour or not. See, I've spoken for the Atlanta PHP group before, which means, of course, I have the Atlanta PHP speakers mug. And when my wife, the lovely and talented Kathy, wife 1.30, found out that the crafting code tour was coming to Atlanta, I was told I would be on the tour, I would speak in Atlanta, because she wants a mug. <laughs> so I do hope you have mugs, or I'm staying at your house tonight, because <laughs> I'm not welcome back home. Anyhow. Real quick, uh, wife, wife 1.30, that's my first wife, and 30, we've been married 30 years. I explain that because um, I recently applied for a WordCamp um, up in, um, well, let's just say one of the blue states. And um, I was it was explained to me that they, they like my talk, but they're very concerned that I put wife 1.30 in my, my bio. And it, was I sure I wanted to leave that there? And I explained to her, I said, this is an expression of my love for my wife. It's my first wife. We've been married 30 years. And she said, oh, yeah, that's not what we were thinking. So, <laughs> so I have to explain it now, I guess. Um, I'm going to drive your cameraman up the wall. I'm a wanderer. So those of you who have seen me speak, you know that. Let's get my slides up here. First of all, can everybody see the, um, the, the, the window over there? Does that, is the font big enough? And the code? Everybody can, you can read the code? OK, because we're going to get to that in a little bit. It's not all slides. We're going to talk about PHP from the CLI. Now, first of all, I will admit this is a beginner's talk, OK? If you are already doing PHP from the CLI, I hope you might be able to pick up a new idea or a new technique. But none of this is really going to be new to you, OK? Before we get started, anybody got a phone, smartphone, reasonably intelligent phone? Hello Windows phone will do. Um, I don't care. No. <laughs> do me a favor. Tweet out a thank you to get Pantheon for me, OK? Um, they're holding my paycheck till they get 15 tweets on this tour. So it'd, be, it'd just really do me a favor if you'd tweet out a thank you to my boss and let them know that you appreciate it. Because they're actually paying my tr um, expenses being here. And um, I'm pretty sure they know that I'm on the clock. But I don't know. No. Um, but they're a wonderful company. I will not. Um, go very far into this, but I just want to say, if you're doing WordPress or Drupal, come talk to me. We'd love to talk to you. We do CMS hosting. That's it. 
okay? Um, but we're very cutting edge um, on doing that. We'd love to talk to you about that. Enough about that. Um, the code that I'm going to present to you tonight, what little of it there is, is out on GitHub if you want to download it and play with it. It's a great way to get started. Now, I will tell you this up front. I'm very honest with every group I talk to. When I create sample code for a talk, they're usually absolutely asinine applications. There's nothing here that you would go, damn, i got to use that in production. Okay, It's just not going to happen. I do that for one reason. I want you to concentrate on the concepts that I'm talking about, not on the code. I don't want you looking at the code. So tonight, we're going to learn how to search Twitter from the command line. Yeah, because, you know, everybody needs to do that, right? This is actually the third time I've written this talk and the second time I've used Twitter. Um, Twitter, back when it was just uh, used HTTP auth, was the hello world of APIs, okay? You knew you could do basic API work when you could post something on Twitter. And with PHP, it was like four lines of code. It was very simple to do. Um, I mean, I taught an entire class, and that's all we did was we set up Twitter accounts and we just posted stuff. If you're going to play with this code, set up a different Twitter account, okay? Nobody cares if it works, I, I'm, I guarantee you, because I've gotten complaints about that. I have a Twitter account that absolutely nobody follows, nobody knows about. It is a random series of characters as the name, and I use it just to test things like this. So first, let's talk about why, okay? As Brandon said, I suck. At, AP, or at design work. I mean, it, it is, it, it is, I, I don't have many flaws, but that's one of them, okay? Um, but it, I am very lucky to be married. That was a joke, okay? I'm <laughs> just, just saying. Um, I, I am very lucky to be married to um, the lovely and talented Kathy, and she is an absolutely wonderful um, graphic designer. Matter of fact, we rolled out a new update to one of my websites over the weekend, and she counts it a positive that not only did she get it launched and get all the technical stuff right, but she didn't kill me in the process. So, um, and she actually tweeted that out, and my friends found that amusing because they know both of us. Um, but I, I'm really horrible at it. I grew up coding, or when I was coding, uh, growing up coding, um, I grew up doing back-end work, and that's where I'm more comfort most comfortable at. I love working with databases and stuff like that, but I just can't stand working in the front end. And there's a lot of processes that I write, little one-offs or uh, what we call hip pocket programs. You know, it just every now and then I need to move stuff from database A to database B and make a change in the process. Or I've got a maintenance script that has to run, you know, every first Thursday of the month or something like that. It just really bothers me that, um, that, that that has to have a web server with it and a web browser. But I just find it easier to work straight from the command line. So that's what I do. Now, this is from an older version of um, this talk. I told you I've done this three times. This is from an older version. But these two things do the exact same thing. This has a form. This has command line. I find it much easier to work in the command line. Oh, wait, no. Um, one of the things I love about working command line, especially if you work with um, Unix, if you work in Windows, I'm not even sure this demo will work. I'll be honest, I have not tested it. I do apologize for that, but it works on OS X and it works in Linux. But if you work in, um, in Linux or Unix uh, environment, then you know that the Unix mantra is do one thing, one small thing and do it very well. You know, you have grep, and you can pipe that to sort, and you can pipe that to awk, and it's usually at that point that I give up and go write something else. I've never gotten awk to be able to work for me, right? But you can pipe everything, you can do all this, and you can get things to work and, and, and make complex tasks out of you very simple commands. And usually when I'm working in um, Unix, in the command line, I can get about 75% the way there. But then I end up having to dump whatever the result is into a text file and open that up in PHP or something else and finish that little thing out. Well, I found out that I don't have to do that. I can make PHP a first-class citizen in the Unix tool chain. I can pipe stuff in and pipe stuff out. And we're going to look at that because that is, to me, very cool. It, it was that aha moment that I said, okay, at this point now, I can do most of what I need to do right here in the command shell. Um, another reason that I do CLI is for security. If I write a script that I, it's a maintenance script, and I have to roll that into production, I have two or three options, none of them good at all. The first option is just to put the URL out there, or put it out on the web server, and it's got a URL, and just not tell anybody. Okay, this is security by obscurity, and if you have security by obscurity, you have no security at all, or what I like to call the TSA model of security. Okay. 
Oh, good. You did recognize that one. The, the people in Charleston just right over their head. Um, so, you, and you, you really don't want to do that. So, your second choice is to whitelist AP or IP addresses. I can whitelist my IP, IP address or whitelist local host. So it can only be called from the local machine or only my machine. But if you do that, then I guarantee you, you're going to get out on the road, be in a hotel room, try to fire it off because it has to be run right now and realize your whitelist or your IP address from the hotel is not in that whitelist. Always a pain. And of course, the third option is you can implement OAuth in security, but then you've got 99 more problems. We're not even going to go into that one, okay? So security is an issue. You don't want to have to maintain a lot of security, but if I'm running command line scripts, if they're on, if the scripts reside on the box and somebody hacks into the box to run my scripts, I got bigger problems than them running my scripts. I've got a compromised server. Now, I'm going to talk a lot tonight about a project I'm working on. It's not a secret project. I am just not here to promote this project, but I'll let you know real quick what the pro project is. It's Nomad PHP. Nomad PHP has an API, but it also has about 10 command line scripts that I've written um, that help me manage it. The beauty is the API sits on my production server. The scripts all sit right here. And I simply build an SSH tunnel into my database on my production server. I can run the scripts right here. They don't reside on production. Even if somebody hacks that box, they can't run my scripts, which, you know, all they could really do is issue coupons for free talks to everybody, but still, you know, they, my, I, I, these commands are secure because they reside on a machine that I physically lock down. So security is one of the reasons that I do it. The most important reason I do this, and I cannot stress this enough, I'm a developer, I'm lazy, okay? I just don't want to have to fire up and get all of this working in the web browser just so I can move data from database A to database B. Now, I've a, got a little bit of OCD in me, okay? OCD programmer. I'm, I'm the guy that when I open a PHP file before I can start working on it, I've got to line up all the equal signs, okay? Anybody? Nobody? I'm the only one that, okay, yeah, there you go. Um, I, I just, it, it just it's got to look nice before I can, and I've been doing that long before PHP, and it usually drives my teammates up the wall. But I, the, the OCD in me says, for a lot of this stuff, a web server is overhead for what I'm doing. I shouldn't have to have a web server involved to do this, because I can get access to everything. And if I'm doing this, I've also got all my friends here, okay? Um, Nomad PHP has models. All my... Um, application logic is encapsulated in models, as it should be in a proper MVC program or MVC architecture. All my um, business rules are, are, are encapsulated in my models, and my API uses those models, and my command script uses those models as well. So I don't have to duplicate the code or the um, concepts just to have two separate systems. They're all in one. And this is one of the reasons that Unix can usually get me about 75% there. But I'm trying, if I'm trying to move data or I'm trying to access those business logics, I can't do that from within a Unix program. And what I would usually have to do is fire up wget and bring the script or use wget or curl to pull the script in and then output that, whatever that outputs, into my Unix pipe. But that's just not the proper way to do it. So let's talk a little bit about how we're going to do this. If you're not familiar with the way PHP works, every time every instance of PHP has a server application program interface, or a SAPI. If you're using Apache, you're probably using mod PHP SAPI. If you're using um, some Apache uh, instances, your uh, setups, you're using fast CGI. If you're using Nginx, you're using fast CGI. If you're using IIS, please stop and use one of the other ones. But no, I'm kidding. Um, no Microsoft people. OK, we're good. Uh, I, I, I find myself now with a lot of my friends that work at Microsoft, so I have to be careful when I tell some of these jokes. Um, but the, the, since the early days of PHP, we've had SAPIs. We have quite a few of them. Okay, now this is not an exhaustive list, but there is a um, PHP get SAPI name function that you can call in your script, and it will return one of these. Yes, that's right. We still support AOL server. There's got to be what? four machines out there left that can even run it, but PHP still supports it. But tonight, we're only worried about the CLI um, SAPI. And I'll show you, uh, when we start looking at the code, you know, how to find out what SAPI you're running, and it'll output it, and we're going to show it to you just so that you can see what it outputs. 
Before we get started, there are two things you need to know about um, command line programming. First of all, the header command, if you're used to working in um, web server or working with web servers and you output custom headers, the header command will take whatever you put in and it will return the proper response. It does absolutely nothing. It just stubbed out, okay? It doesn't fail on you, so if you've got a script that you um, forget to take it out of there, but it's not going to do anything. The obvious reason is we have no browser to interpret that header, so we don't need the header. And the second thing, and I am so glad we have this now, is that your error messages are in plain text. I am old enough to have used PHP back before we had this. Um, back, I believe it was this was in, introduced in 5.1, and back before then, um, we would get full HTML as your errors. And you know, looking at full HTML in a command line, you've got to, okay, no, I'm not looking for that. Oh, that's the error number and the line number I'm looking for. Nowadays, it just outputs plain text for you. It's wonderful. Now, there are two ways to accomplish programming from the CLI. There's what I call freestyle, okay? And this is you use wget to call a URL, and it will do whatever you do it. Now, this is a URL from an older talk. And it, the older talk um, used an API um, from a company called Tropo to send SMS messages. Very important lesson I'm going to share with you. Don't check in your config files to GitHub, especially if they contain your phone number. For three years, I got this is a test messages because I forgot to take my phone number out of my configuration file. Be very careful. Matter of fact, we're going to talk a little bit about configuration files tonight, and I'll show you um, how I now do it, having learned this lesson. But I share that with you. Hopefully, you don't have to live the same nightmare of 3 a.m. The phone goes, ding! You know, it says, this is a test. They weren't even original enough to, to, to put a new message in. Uh, but we've all done this. We've all, we've all used wget or curl or... Um, links in command mode or whatever to pull file or to, to execute URLs, okay? And that's one of the reasons that this is the primary way that people use PHP from the CLI is we all know how to use those tools. And it's easy to cron a process. Now, if you're not familiar with Unix in, or OS X, cron is a scheduler, okay? You can tell something to do something every minute, every five minutes. Basically, every minute it wakes up, looks at a file, and says, is there anything I need to do right now? And you can use this arcane format in the file to tell it, at this point in time, do this. And it's what we call croning a process. Um, and it's how we do a lot of these automated things. And we can just put wget and a URL in there, boom, we're done. But that's just, like I said, the, the, the OCD in me says I don't need, I should not need wget, I should not need a web server to do some of these things. The upside is I can usually use the code as is. I can take my existing code, modify it a little bit to do what I want, you know, maybe drop a new controller in there and, in my system and um, tell it to do something new, and we're done. And with this, we're going to have to get a whole new setup. It's going to take a little bit, not much, but we're going to have to shave a yak or two to get it done. So a lot of people just say, oh, I'll just do it this way because I've got everything and I can always use it as is. But in reality, there is a better way. Doing it from the command line in systems that are written to run from the command line is a better way. There's a lot more options that you can use um, to, to, build, to, to make it run exactly the way you want. Um, this is not exactly a new way. We've had this, we've actually had um, P, the PHP CLI SAPI since, um, I want to say 4.3 is the first time I remember call it. And I say 4.3 because I remember researching the, or an earlier version of this talk and um, went looking for it and found a blog post that I had written right when it came out that says, woohoo, we've got the CLI. So apparently that was when it came out. But um, we, we've had it for quite some time. Matter of fact, if you use any of the modern frameworks, you already have the ability to do this. Now, I'm going to be using Symfony. Um, I'm going to be using a component from Symfony um, to do the, the Twitter thing. I'm also going to be using a component from Zen Framework. This is not a Symfony talk. It's not any framework talk. It's just this is how I build it. But if, you've got, if you're using Symfony, if you're already building systems on Symfony or Zen Framework or R or any of the rest of them, then you've already got everything you need to do this. By the way, if you are looking at frameworks and you've not done so already, take a look at Aura. It's written by a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Paul Jones. Um, he's over in Nashville with us now. Um, I get nothing for 
promoting this, but it is, in, in looking at it and looking at the other ones out, it is one of the coolest frameworks out there. He really understands the whole concept of decoupling so that you can um, use just a piece. Symphony is new to this, but they've really got it going now. Um, some of the older ones um, haven't even done, or haven't started yet. Zen Framework, as we'll see, is really trying, but you know, they, they really haven't hit it yet. So anyhow, so let's talk a little bit about the pieces um, that we're gonna, um, we're gonna use. We're gonna shave a yak, and then we're gonna start looking at some code. So the pieces that we're gonna use, first thing is Bootstrap. Now this is the file that we actually run. Um, it looks very similar to this. Now, if you are familiar with Unix programming, then you know Shebang up there tells it what interpreter to use. And this was simply tells it everything else is to be interpreted from PHP. So we're made, we've got a Unix command shell that is running, but it's going to run PHP the rest of the time. And then we require once the composer vendor autoload. Now, how many people are using composer? OK, this half of the room, seriously, got it. No, except for you. You really need to look into it. There have been two or three things um, that have changed the way I code and Composer in, in PHP in 10 years, and Composer is one of them, okay? It, it really will change the... Composer, Xdebug, and the rise of frameworks are the three things that have changed the way I look at coding. But Composer really will because it, it takes care of all your dependencies for you. You need a library, as we will see when we start shaving yaks. You need a library. You tell it, Composer, I need this library. And then all you have to do is include or require once that auto load. That's the only require in the entire system. OK, end of commercial for um, Composer. Um, we tell it what namespaces we're using. And then we load our config file in here, that .env. Now, we're using .env written by my buddy Vance Lucas. It's available out on um, GitHub. We'll use Composer to install it. But all this does is create local environment variables for us. And I'll show you how we specify them and all this. But as long as you remember never to ever check in a .env into your repo, you should be good. Okay. Matter of fact, I've got it in my git ignore. I have to actually force it if I want to check in a .env uh, because I never, ever want to check in my configuration. Um, in this case, it's my Twitter credentials, and you know that, that would be a lot worse than just my phone number. So, um, Then we look at the models. Now, I'll show you. I, I won't actually show you any models in this. Um, this is a do as I say, not as I do, because there's no business logic to be encapsulated in the system. But if you're building model view controller systems, you already have a library of models encapsulating your business um, logic. Okay, so we can use those you know, very easily. Matter of fact, we would, in this case, we just, uh, I'm using the PHP from the CLI namespace. Um, in Nomad PHP, I'm using the Nomad PHP namespace. That gives me access to all the models that are already in there. Then there's the view. Now, the controller is the command code that we're going to be writing. But the view is kind of odd in command line code. You don't really need a view. I mean, views are great for um, doing um, looping logic and putting stuff in there and setting up one base HTML template and making sure that everything else um, or everything run looks the same. But we're dealing with stuff from the command line. It's really not going to make any difference whatsoever. So in this case, and this is the only time you will ever hear me do this, I, I simply put the output right in my command, okay? Because we're just outputting straight to the screen. Um, there's no other client I have to worry about, and I'm certainly not going to output JSON or XML or anything, or, or have to swap between them um, like you would in a web interface. <coughs> And then the controller. Now, in model view controller systems, the controller is called the controller. In this system, they're called commands. And you'll see them, uh, when I show you one, you'll see that it extends the symphony command. But it acts as the controller. Controllers in model view controller systems act as your traffic cop. They are what instantiate your models, what tell it your models to do something, and usually what tells your view, go display this. But in this case, it also just handles the view piece for us. And then the config. Now, let's take a look at the config real quick. You'll notice this is nothing more than a key, key equals value or um, key value pair um, file. The keys are on the left, equals the separator, and anything on the right is considered the value. Notice the keys are all in uppercase. There is no rule that says it has to be that. I can use uppercase, um, lowercase, I can use train case, snake case, whatever case I want to use. 
as long as I remember to use it the same way in my code, okay? That's why I always stick with uppercase um, in, in all of them for, um, for this. So we, we set this, these, um, we'll get these pieces from Twitter. Now, if you are gonna set up a, com a separate Twitter account, and I strongly urge you to do that, um, the first thing you do after you get logged in with your new Twitter account is go to dev.twitter.com and get access to the API. And they'll have, they'll, fill, they'll, they'll have you fill out a form that asks you all kind of important questions. Why do you want this? And all that. They really don't care. I have put poopin in every field, and they're fine with it, OK? So um, just you know, fill out the form. When you go to get your OAuth credentials, put your, or tell it you want read-write. And this is important because this system only uses read. We're only reading from Twitter, OK? But in three months, when you go back to it and say, hey, if I can read, I can also write, then, and you haven't done that, then you've got to go back and get all new credentials for read-write. So go ahead, and it's a checkbox, tell it, I want read-write access, and then it'll give you your, o, um, your OAuth credentials, and you can put them right here in this file. This file, a sample ENV, is included in the repo. Okay, we've got to shave a yak here. We use the Symphony console as the basis of our system. We use Vance Lucas's php.env. Now, if you download the, um, the, the repo, all you have to do is go in the repo if you have Composer installed and say, Composer install, boom, it's going to suck all this in because the JSON, um, the, 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 the composer.json is already in there for you. This is going to bring in one file. This is going to bring in one file. We're talking a thousand lines between them. This is going to bring in a hundred thousand lines of code. Zend really has not figured out how to do this small stuff. <laughs> this, this code, this, the Zen Twitter account or Twitter client is actually bigger than the rest of the system combined. And having said that, it is the one that I continue to use simply because it is the one that I know how to use. Pardon me for just a second. Okay, so we do all of this. We, do, we tell Composer to require those. Those are actually commands that you execute in your command, uh, from your command line. Um, and then we do a Composer install. Boom, we've got everything we need. Let's finish shaving the yak. Let's flesh out our directory structure. Um, this is the Composer JSON file that comes with it. You'll notice down here in the auto load section, that's the important part. We tell it that our namespace is PHP from the CLI, and that's also the directory that everything is stored in. And those two are the same on purpose. They have to be the same. But we tell it that this is going to be in a directory called app. Okay? So you have your project file, or project directory. It has a directory called app, and it has a directory called PHP from the CLI. And everything goes underneath there. That's the, for the PSR autoloading. Everybody familiar with PSRs? No? Okay. Most of you, uh, some of you are. Um, PSR is a, um, granted, I don't forgot again. No, it is FIG, um, the Framework Interoperability Group, but I forget what PSR stands for. Ah, PHP Standard Recommendation. Thank you. Um, the Framework Operability Group is a member of the, the leadership from all the major frameworks and most of the major projects. Um, and we all get together online and figure out ways to make life hell for everybody else. No, um, we try to figure out ways so that all the frameworks work together um, for common causes. And the very first thing that we put together was the proper way or the, the acceptable way for auto loading to be done. And most of the modern frameworks these days, um, and in, uh, including um, Drupal and a couple of the CMSs, um, will support PSR0. So if you see PSR0, that's auto-loading. Um, it just means that all of this works, oops, all of this works without a problem, okay? Um, this little class map down here is in case I want to put my own stuff. And if I put my own stuff, it says um, they'll be in a directory called SRC in the root of the project. So app and SRC are in the root of the project. This just lets Composer know where to find everything. The rest of this is just boilerplate. These will be automatically put in for you if you're doing the requires or if you um, download the code, they're already there. One quick side note, you'll notice that I have a license called MIT, okay? Um, if you have code that you're open sourcing and you're putting up on GitHub, please put a license on it. If you don't put a license, what you are in effect saying is, 
look at all this cool code I've written that you can't touch. Because none of us can use it if we don't know what the license is. Uh, we can't use it in our open source projects because what if you decide to come back and say, well, I didn't put a license on that and I'm not going to license it to you now. So we can't build with it. And we certainly can't use it in our um, corporate projects without a proper license. There's 35 approved license by the OSI. I love MIT. It is the simplest one out there. It simply says, as long as you leave my name and my email address on here and, uh, in the copyright notice, you can do whatever you want with this code. Okay? Does it require anything else? So that's what I use. But if you're putting it up on GitHub and you want people to use it, please put a license on it. Okay. We are pretty much done with the slide portion of our program. Let's, just, let's look at some code. Okay, um, I'm going to have to do this backwards, so that's going to be fun. i got to find my mouse. Oh, there we are. There's the mouse. Okay, I'm going to, we have four commands in the system. I'm going to run through one of them, this first one, in detail for you, but the rest of them are basically the same thing over and over again with just a little bit of changing, so I'm just going to talk about the, the, the difference on them um, after we get through this. So the first thing we do is we define our namespace, and then we use all the pieces that we're going to need. Now, symphony, component, console, command, command. That's the heart of what we're doing. That's the class that we, sub -command, or we subclass for every one of ours. And you can see that right down here, extends command. And then we use one little trait that I've written. Um, you can see it when you get it in there. Um, it's actually not necessary these days. Um, Symphony's made some changes in their command, but I just haven't updated my code to reflect those changes yet. Um, but then we get down, we create our class, and the first function we have is configure. Notice there is no um, constructor. Don't create a constructor. Command creates the constructor. If you try to override that, even if you get it right, um, chances are something will screw up. So leave the constructor alone. Configure is the first thing that runs for your code. And basically, as soon as it instantiates everything, it calls configure, and in this case, we're simply telling it the name of this is test, the description is test setup, and a little help, which as you can see is not much help at all if you actually had to, to get that, or to, um, to look at that. But that's what you're going to see. Where do we go? There we go. Um, console. Help test. Okay. Test the connection to Twitter. Okay. Test the connection to Twitter. You see the relationship here. Okay, That's all it does. Now, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with fluent interfaces. Raise your hand if you're not. OK, good. You're not, fluent interfaces are very simple, and they look very cool. Okay, See how this does not have this in front of every one of them, and there's only one semicolon? Basically, I'm chaining all of these um, three together. Now, the only secret to this is, Set name, set description, and set help are all methods of this object. They all have a line at the very end that says return this, which allows me to chain, since this is returning, uh, this set name is returning this, then I'm executing set description off of this, which is coming back from there. It's what we call fluid interfaces. Uh, different languages call them different things. Some of them call them chaining commands. They look very cool. Uh, if you use Zen Framework, MWAP, Matthew Weir, for any supreme allied commander of Zen Framework, salute, loves fluent interfaces. Man, um, in Zen Framework 1, those things were all over the place. Um, I haven't looked at Zen Framework 2, but my guess is he's still in love with them. Um, there's no magic to it, and there's nothing special about doing these. You, if you've got methods that you want to do this, as long as they return this, you're golden. Okay? That's my little quick intro to fluent interfaces. If you have some code to set up your class, Put it here and configure. This will get called before anything else. Just You can put it right down here. We'll look at one other thing uh, we can do, which is set command line options. Test has no command line options. We'll look at that in just a second. OK, execute is the other must-have method. Execute, if you're a Java programmer, executes like Java run, your, your run method. OK, I'll not bother to make a Java joke there. If they kind of make themselves. But it's like your Java run. Uh, <laughs> oops. Come back down here. It gives you, um, it, it takes two parameters, an input and an output. The input is, or the input is a symphony 
request object if you use symphony and the output is a symphony response object and that's where our um, our output to the screen is located and that's why you'll see that I always save it off right here I put it in this output that way any method in my object has uh, access to it not just the execute as you can see right there okay the first thing we do is we output the CLI and I just output whatever sappy we're using and it's going to be CLI if you run this test command and the first thing it says is not CLI stop immediately something is horribly wrong okay uh, but this is going to print out just the word CLI then we're going to set up Twitter okay we call our set Twitter credentials let's go down here and look at that this is a magic array the Zend Twitter client has to have this exact array set up exactly like this. You, you can't deviate from this. If you do screw it up, and this is the most common problem with using it is people don't get this array just right. So you set up your access tokens, your auth tokens. Notice we're using the, do, the dollar sign env super global. That's where the um, environment variables are set up. And notice they're all in uppercase here because I set them up in uppercase in the env file. See that uppercase? Now, they are not, for those of you um, familiar with the Unix, they're not exported. They're only local. So as soon as the script quits running, they're gone. They're not hanging around in memory. Nobody can get hold of them or anything like that. They are gone. Okay, so we set up our Twitter credentials and we return them right there. And then we set up our Twitter account or our, our Twitter client. And we simply call verify credentials. Now, verify credentials will return to us response. Response is the biggest, ugliest object you have ever seen. If you print our response at this point, you will be here a while. Go make coffee, okay? It is huge. Um, I, I, so you just, I, I don't know why Zend needs all of this just to do a response, but I'm sure they have a very good reason because Matthew is a very smart man. Um, I cast it to, uh, uh, I use the two value method to get the output, and I simply look for um, does errors exist? If errors exist, there's a problem. I'm just going to print them out on the screen. If errors do not exist, I'm going to say credentials succeeded for whatever the screen name is. And then I always output done. Gets me in trouble every now and then because, as you can see, it's going to screw up our output in a little bit. But I always write that. That lets me know the script got to the end point that I expected. Because if you have, like my system, my, um, in my production server is set up, all my error output is going to a file, then this could finish and not hit done because it errored out, and I wouldn't know until I actually check the um, file. It is actually possible for it not to show me any errors. So I always put the done down there just to let me know, yep, we got to the end of execute. Okay, let's take a look at this, what this looks like. This is going to wow you, be prepared to go ooh and or ah. Boom! We have done, thank you, he's paying attention. Um, notice the very first thing it says is CLI, because we're using the CLI SAPI. If, for some reason, you set this code up and called it from a web server, and it wouldn't be too terribly difficult to do that, um, then it would not say CLI, it would say fast CGI, it would say mod PHP, it would say whatever you know, the PHP interpreter you're currently using. Um, and then it says, Credentials succeeded for Nomad Ruby, which is the Twitter account that happens. I happen to have um, OAuth for that I wasn't using at the moment, so I just used that one. And the obligatory done. That's all it takes. We have now successfully run a script from the command line. Now, the rest of these are very similar. Um, I'm going to talk about search because that's the heart of the system. I'm only going to go over the differences. And one of the differences you'll notice very first is definition I'm creating an array called definition okay and definition has four options and these are my four command line options the first thing is the long name if you're familiar with Unix you know you know you have dash dash long name or dash short name the first is the long name and the second is the short name that's dash e now in this case English is a flag it requires no value. If it exists, something will happen. In this case, it will filter all the non-English tweets, or at least Twitter tries to filter all the non-English tweets. Twitter's not that bright. So, um, but it'll try to filter all the um, non-English tweets. Now, only names is a flag. 
If I set that flag, if I set the add dash O or the dash dash only dash names, then I'm only going to get the names of the Twitter um, accounts that are tweeting, not the, uh, everything else. Um, count is actually something that takes a value, but it's optional. Search term is actually required. We have to have a search term. However, that's the only one. You'll notice this very last property. That's the default value. If you don't spec... If you don't specify a value for search term, and I usually don't because I enjoy searching for um, the hashtag PHP just to see who's talking about PHP, but if I don't specify a search term, which is required, it will use hashtag PHP as what we're searching for. Let's get that back over there. Okay, so same fluent interfaces, set name, set description. Now we have set definition in there as well, set help, boom, we're done. Down to execute. <clears throat> I pull off output. Now I've got this method called set output, and I found this really cool, so I'm going to show you. This is the only time I've ever done this is in this sample code. Symphony's um, output system has formatters, and you can do all kinds of things with them. In this case, I wanted to color colorize things a little bit. So my username for the tweet is going to be in green because you can't see that, but it says green there. And the tweet is going to be just in regular black and white. Okay, You can do all kinds of things with the formatters. I just chose to do that. The important thing here is we have to use this in a tag, like an HTML tag, surrounding whatever we want to be defined as the username. And so you'll see that. But we set that up down here, and then we just return. Okay, we set up our output or our, our options using the input get option. Okay, for the flags, I'm just going to pull it in. This is either going to give me null or it's going to give me a um, positive value, a true value. Um, and then for count, that's going to give me, if I specified it, that's going to give me a number. Okay, Twitter will allow you to specify how many tweets to display, zero through or one through 20. Um, and if you don't specify one, it's going to give you 20. Then I set up Twitter, which we've already seen. I set up my search options. Now, the um, only two search options we have are specifying a language and specifying the count. Those go in an array because the actual call to search tweets, it wants our search term first. And if we do not specify one, it will use the default. And then it wants our array of um, search options. So anything else, search term is separate. It's not part of the um, array. Okay, and we get down here, and again, it's going to give us a response, which is a big honking thing. It's got an awful lot of things. All we really care about are the tweets themselves, and those are called statuses. So we cast it, or we use the two value to bring it as an object, and we say, of that object, I really only care about the property called statuses. Now, this is new in 5. Three that we could do that, but that way I don't have to say response to value and then tweets equals um, response statuses. I, I make this all in one call. And I put that in a for next loop, output it. Notice I use username here. And if we scroll over, you'll see I wrap this in a tweet tag. That's for my formatters. And the obligatory done. Okay, let's take a look at what that looks like. Without any options, nope, console, search. Without any options, dang it, you would know. This is the one time that I've run that that I actually did not get any foreign tweets, but they all look English, so I can't point them out and say, look. Uh, but that gives us 20 tweets. Notice I've got um, the green for the person tweeting, and then I've got whatever they tweeted, and they've got pound PHP. It is not case sensitive. Twitter search is not case sensitive, so you're going to get upper, lower, any kind of mix. That's it. You can now search Twitter. You can sit at the command line and search Twitter. I know that's what you're dying to do. What this gives us is, oh, let's look at one more piece of code, because this is, quite, fun, quite honestly, the silliest of them all. You see I have four up here. 
There's also a work. Now, the work wasn't in the bootstrap file. And I never show that as part of the bootstrap file, but I, every one of these that I write, I have a work command in there for one reason. I get halfway through working on a command and I'm like, okay, how does this work again? And I just need to work on this one little piece. So I have work command, I can just pop that in real quick and type console work, and I can put any code I want in there and it, you know, I can execute it and I can work on a little sub piece of it until I get that right and then put it back in the command. I always take that back out. Never, ever, ever, if you do this, never check work command into your repo. You never want to do that because you don't know what you've left in there. And usually when I've got stuff in there, I, I've been known to um, encode passwords in there and all kind of stuff. It could be horrend, horrendous if you actually do that. So don't check your, uh, if you use a work for a scratch pad, don't check it in. Um, but the other one is echo. Now echo is quite simply the silliest command I think I've ever written. That's, that's it almost in its entirety. Um, and it comes down to this piece right here. In Unix, you have standard in and standard out, okay? And um, what, error, error out. With the PHP command line, in the SAPI, they set up and open standard in for you already and standard out. Now, we don't have to mess with standard out. Symphony handles that. But if you want to read something in, just a raw stream, you can use any of the file commands for uh, and use standard in as a handle. It's already set up for you. And we're going to do that because all this does is this takes whatever's coming in from the standard in and it writes it back out with a line number and a colon. Okay, pretty simple. I can show you how that operates. Where'd it go? There we go. Console. Oh, no, let's go back over here. That was a cow. I am not vain enough to have my own Unix command. That's the calendar. For those of you who don't know Unix, <laughs> and we'll say echo. And notice we have one through seven, a colon, and then the month's calendar. Okay, that's all echo does. I know, stunning, right? Um, but anyhow, now that we've got all the pieces here, we can say console search, and let's go English only. And let's. That's still a little too verbose, so let's get just the names. Now, notice, Brian Webworks is being very verbose tonight, okay? And there's a lot of times when you do this. Now, it, usually well, when I'm doing the, what I'm about to show you, I'm usually searching through a um, Apache log looking for IP addresses of people that are trying to do bad things with my web server. But we've all done this. You go through that, you pull out the IP address, and then you got to figure out, oh, you know, well, I need only one line per IP address. So if you use Unix, you use the sort command and then the, unic, or the unique command, and you've got all this. Well, let's, let's play with that. So... Let's take our console and let's pipe it to sort and let's pipe it to unique. And the first thing you'll know is, notice is the green goes away because the Unix commands don't honor the ANSI commands that are in there, or the um, color codes that are in there. But now we've got it down to just a few people, but how many people do we actually have? Well, we can, since we have this handy dandy stupid little echo command, we can say console echo, and it echoes out a formatted list. There are nine people that have tweeted the last 20, 20 tweets about PHP. And I know all of you are going, but Cal, the web interface for Twitter will do this. Don't miss the point. Look at what we've done. We've taken our PHP code and done something with it, and then we've started, we, we've sent it through sort, and we've sent it through unique. And somebody, usually at this point, I've got um, some smart aleck who will point out that done is still in there. To which point I always have to go in here and say grep dash v done. I think that'll do it. So now we have the eight. Thank you all, all for not being that group. Every other group has pointed this out. Um, but look, we've now we, we've taken our PHP, we've run something, and then we've started piping it into Unix commands. Now there's a ton of Unix commands, and there's also other commands that you can use. Um, Ruby commands, or if you want to run, pipe it into a Python command. But then we've taken the output and piped it back into our program and done something with it. 
PHP is now a first class citizen of a Unix tool chain. And to me, as a Unix program, because all my web servers are Unix, I use um, OSX on my laptop and I've got a Mac mini at home, so I'm pretty much dead set on Unix. This is awesome to me because now I've got all my Unix friends that I've been using. I've been doing Unix since 1985. My first instance of Unix that I ever worked on was Xenix. I don't know if you remember Xenix, and this is one of those I kid you not moments. Xenix was Microsoft's license of Unix. Okay, It's been that long ago. But I, I've been learning all these commands, and I now have them access to them. And instead of Unix getting me 75% of the way there, and then I have to pipe it into a file and open it up in a text editor and finish it myself, I can now pipe it into PHP and make PHP finish it out for me. I can also do all of this in a cron job, or I can do a piece of this in a cron job. Um, like I said, with Nomad PHP, I have several of them that run on a regular basis that are just uh, this exact same code that you, you've been seeing. They're, they're um, symphony commands that I'm running like that. Thus endeth the coding portion of our session. Let's swap back to the slides and finish it up. Can I have my mouse back? Thank you. OK. So let's wrap it up. Why do I do it? I'm lazy and it's easy to do. That's what the, 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 the um, first part of it. The other reason is I never ever have to worry about HTML. I don't want to mess with HTML. I have trouble with design, as you can see from my slides, because this, if you've ever seen me talk, is my standard slide deck. Black text, white graphics. I've got um, two pictures, three pictures, at the, on one slide, and that's it, okay? I don't want to have to mess with this stuff. I'm a back-end programmer. It offends me to have to set a color on, on stuff that doesn't need a color. I can, <laughs> I can use this to write maintenance scripts. I don't have to run my maintenance scripts from a web server anymore. That just the OCD programmer means this. I don't need this. Why should I have to have it? This one's important. As of PHP 5.3, we can now run long-running processes that run from the command line. Up before PHP 5.3, there was a bug that had a memory leak. Um, I found out about the hard way. I was um, running a team out in Santa Clara in um, 2004, just right before I joined Zen. And we had a client that had 30 web servers. Each web server would generate about a gigabyte a day of Apache log files. And they needed all of those sucked in so that they can merge them and sort them and hunt them down or um, do searches on them. And I said, oh, well, that's easy. Database. So I wrote a script that would bring them in one file at a time. And my test files had 10,000 lines each, and they would run approximately two or 3,000 lines per second. And it would just scream. And I figure, hey, this is the way it's going to work. Well, I started it, went home, came back the next morning. It was running one record, not one file, one record every four minutes, okay? And my machine had absolutely no memory left. It, I had to turn the machine off to stop the process. That's when I found out that PHP had a memory leak. But in five, um, as of 5.3, the, um, the, the core gods have blessed us. They have fixed this problem. And so we can now run long-running processes. I actually have a process running on my little Mac Mini back at the house. It's been running three months. Now, it's not a terribly difficult process to run. It wakes up every 10, 20 minutes and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? If not, it goes back to sleep. When it does wake up and there's something to do, it runs for about a day, and then it goes back to sleep. But it's been running three months without interruption. That's awesome. I didn't have to go get C or anything else or, or Python to run this. I was able to do this with the language that I know. But I also, since I'm using PHP, I have all access to all my models. I have access to um, everything that I normally use to program. And this is awesome. Now, don't write daemons in this. PHP wasn't designed for it. And I know if I don't specify that, somebody's going to tweet, Cal said write daemons in PHP. No, it's not what I said. And quite honestly, if you're, running a, if you're writing a long process, the process is going to be running for a long time, look and see if a queue won't do the job better for you. Okay, About half the time, a queue will do it um, just as good or better for you. And um, that's a better tool. But anyhow, you can now write long running processes. My name is Cal Evans. You can find my blog at blog.calevans.com. I don't say that to get you to go out to my blog. I'm warning you. If you type that in, you're going to come to my blog. You probably don't want to go there. If you're there, it's by accident. I'm absolutely positive. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. 
I am an attention whore. I speak, you know, for user groups. That's proof enough that I'm an attention whore. Please follow me because I love having more and more and more followers. I don't say anything intelligent, but I love collecting followers. Um, I work for a company called Pantheon. Like I said, we are a CMS hosting solution, uh, very high end. Uh, we have um, very small clients like the Boston Herald, and uh, we host a site for, I believe, Netflix, and uh, not their main site, but we host a site for them. Thing, little, little companies like that. But if you'd like to be in that kind of group, we'd love to talk to you. And finally, if, uh, and I, I hesitate to mention this. Uh, can I talk about, no, you sure? Okay. I, well, I, I don't usually mention this in, in user groups because I am not trying... Um, I run a project called Nomad PHP. It is the user group for PHP developers that don't have a local user group. You are blessed to have a local user group. Matter of fact, I kind of consider this my home user group away from home because I've been here so many times and it's just fun. Every time I'm through Atlanta and there's a meeting, I'm like, I'm going to go because I love this group. But even though you've got a good group, um, there are times when um, there are speakers that can't make it to Atlanta. Um, that's one of the things we do. We bring in the speakers that you would normally see at conferences. We have them give a virtual presentation, and you get to ask them questions. And it's the presentations that they give at conferences. So if you can't make it to the conferences, and I strongly urge you, go to the conference. Man, there's one down in Miami called Sunshine PHP that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, the leader, Adam Culp, is a little damaged in the head. Uh, don't, don't say anything to him, but he keeps asking me to come back so, and speak, so you know there's something wrong with him. But um, it is a phenomenal conference, um, and it's not very expensive. So if you um, can... If you can, you know, suffer through Miami in um, February, you know, which I'm from Tennessee, so Miami in February is awesome. But uh, that's a great place to go. But if you can't, we'd love to have you as part of Nomad PHP. It is a pay service. Um, you can buy one meeting or you can buy a subscription. Um, subscription gets you both meetings every month, and you get the you get to down at that point you get to download the videos, carry them on your iPad, watch them on the Marta or. Don't, don't watch them while you're driving, but if on your commute, if somebody else is driving, that would be a great thing to um, kill time. Anyhow, that's all I've got. Um, I am here for the rest of the evening, for the rest of the meeting. I want to thank you for your attention. I appreciate you listening to an old man ramble. And I'm going to turn it back over to my good friend, Mr. Brandon Savage. Thank you. Okay. I won't keep you that much longer. Um, isn't Cal great? I really, I really like having Cal come and give a talk. So, but uh, thanks, Cal, for coming and joining us. And thank you, Pantheon, for letting Cal have us. Since it's a unique user group meeting, I have a short 10-minute talk on code quality that I'm going to share with you. And then I guess we'll all go drinking. <laughs> I like that response. <laughs> a little bit about who I am. Uh, I used to work for Mozilla a long time, not long time ago, January. I guess in the tech world, maybe that is a long time ago. I've written a couple of books, uh, which are actually on sale at the moment. Uh, I'm an instrument rated private pilot. In fact, this is how I got here today. Uh, so this is my airplane, and I flew it from Florida into Peachtree. That uh, was a long, long way. <laughs> uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about how you can measure your code and how you know if you're doing a good job with it. We talked a little bit about complexity earlier when I talked about code climate. Uh, now we're going to talk about how you can measure complexity and how you can find it in your own code and how you can identify ways of dealing with it. There are two measures of complexity that are very common. The first one is known as cyclomatic or cyclomatic complexity, and it measures the number of decision points that you have in your code. For example, you might have code that looks something like this. And in this code, there are decision points. This, of course, when you enter the function, that's the first decision point. And then each of the conditionals or loops or things like that are decision points as well, giving us a cyclomatic complexity of four. Now, it's great to have a number, but that doesn't really help us without having some kind of a scale. So let's take a look at a scale of cyclomatic complexity. The idea here is that we measure the number of decision points, and that helps us to know whether or not we have really, really complex code, or if our code's actually pretty simple, straightforward, and that's the goal. That's what we're after here. Now, this is a good measure, it's a basic measure, but it's an incomplete measure. There's a second measure called n-path complexity that I like a little bit better, which actually measures the number of unique paths in your code, and it also happens to be the number of tests you need in your code to successfully test it. So looking at the same code, we of course have the function, we go into the function, and we have our four decision points, but we actually have a total of eight code paths. Okay. 
because we can go in and we can go into the first if and we can go into the second if or the third if. We can go into first and third, so on and so forth. So this measures code co co uh, complexity a little differently. Rather than decision points, it measures unique paths. It measures the actual different paths you can go into your code. And this tells us as well it would take eight tests to test each and every path in our code. Now, n path complexity, because it's exponential, the complexity level and the scale is a little bit different. So instead of four, it's 16 is, is considered low complexity. But I tend to find that when you get over 17 to 20, you're probably looking at something you want to think about refactoring. And, and over that, I mean, there are some methods, for example, in, in Drupal that they've now factored out that would take four terabytes of tests, uh, according to Anthony Farrar. He did the math on this. I'm going to believe that he's right. So how do you know what your complexity is? Just these measures are good, but there's other ways to know as well. You can use your tests as code quality metrics. The first way I like to look at this is I like to ask the question, does the code even have tests? I found that the more complicated code is, even if it has a great low cyclomatic complexity, if you can't write tests for it, then the code probably is really complex. So tests are a first measure that I like to look at. Does it even have tests? If it has tests, I like to look at whether or not it has uh, uh, code coverage, what the quality of the code coverage is. Because even if you have tests, if it's just a functional test that runs all the way through from the front end to the back end, that might not necessarily be good, non, you know, uncomplicated code. And you can see, you can track the metrics uh, of your code coverage with Jenkins. Who in here uses continuous integration or build server? A couple, couple of people, a few people. Yeah. You, all of you should use a build server. They're awesome. Now, I'd like to point out that getting to 100% code coverage isn't the goal. I usually get anywhere from 90 to 95%. You're going to have code that you just can't test. That's OK. The goal is not to eliminate all untestable code. The goal is to test as much as is humanly possible. If you can get to 100, great. More power to you. But if you're at 20% or 15%, that's a problem. That's something that you want to definitely take a look at. You can also look at your code and you can identify what I call or what are called code smells. And code smells are a coding practice that identifies some kind of lower level issue with the code. And PHP mess detector is good for this. Uh, you can use it. There's a bunch of libraries that are built in with it that'll detect these things and highlight them for you. But there's some common ones you can just see with your eyes by looking at the code. So here's, here's some code for you. Uh, and I've actually fixed the bug in future slides for whoever's doing the tweeting from coding it wrong. Feel free to take a picture, because that's, that's a pretty ugly mistake. Uh, but here's some code. Basic you know, user controller does authentication. And there's a few smells in here that I like to, to point out. The first one is we're using globals. Okay. Globals, whether they are dollar underscore variable name or static methods or anything like that that's global is a code smell. Because when you're talking about globals, you're not really doing object-oriented programming. So these are easy to spot. They're easy to get rid of. I like to see them gone. Globals, not so much. The second thing that we're doing here is we're instantiating an object in, a, in another object. Now the problem with doing that is that I can't ever take this database object and test it because the database object is just there. It's always going to be the same database object. Uh, since I'm not passing in any configuration, it's always going to get the same connection. So to write tests, I'm going to have to test all the way through to the database. Well, that's not a unit test. So it's going to make it difficult to test this. And in fact, I would imagine that the code coverage, if I was to write a test for this code sample, would be pretty darn low. In addition, I have the die command in here. Now, Anybody who's ever used WordPress and had a database connection failure knows right away that WordPress does this too. If you can't connect to the database, it says database connection error or something to that effect. And this big H1 on the screen, and that's the last thing it does before it completely exits. We're developers. We develop for the web, most of us. We need to have some way of handling these errors. Try catch with a redirection to a 500 page. Uh, some kind of useful information for the user, just handling the error, you know, we could, we could do something with the error. That's our responsibility. 
Um, when you're doing the command line, like Cal, you can use die all you want. But when you're doing it for the web, we have to handle this in some way. And then the fourth one, which is a little harder to see, is this concept that this is just doing too much. This code has four or five jobs in one method. So if we're talking about an object that's supposed to have a single responsibility, we, we broke that in the first method that we wrote in it. Uh, this has to do the SQL, get the globals, create the object, handle the results, and then do something with it. So this, this is the code smell that you want to get out of. The more your object or your method does, the more problems it's going to create. Okay. I said it was a fast presentation, and it's a fast presentation. Any questions about what I said? that I can answer, or that Cal can answer if you have questions about his talk. He's shaking his head in the back, so. Okay. Um, I'm teaching a class in Atlanta tomorrow. There's one seat left in the class. So if you are interested in learning about object-oriented PHP and actually doing it hands-on, please feel free to go to this link and register, but there's one seat left. So if there's one of you in here that wants to take it, you'll get lucky, and everybody else, not so much. Um, so I'm teaching that tomorrow. Feel free to, to t check that out. I want to say thank you again to Code Climate for having Cal and I here. Uh, they did a, you know, they, they, they've done a lot of work with, with this and we're very thankful for them. So please tweet at them, say thank you, uh, take a look at the gift cards. Mandrill bought pizza for everybody tonight, so if you enjoyed the pizza, definitely thank them as well. Uh, they've given me some t-shirts. I think Chris has some t-shirts that he may or may not give away. Um, and but definitely thank them as well. Thank you again to Pantheon for loaning us the great and powerful Cal Evans. And thanks again to all of the sponsors that have made this a possibility. Uh, because Cal and I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for them. So thank you all for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Chris. He's got some announcements. Uh, and let's go drinking. <laughs>